Good evening, everybody, here at the Odeon, the beautiful place. Um, my name is Monique Knappen, and I am the director of the John Adams Institute. I think many of you know we are this Dutch-run independent lecture podium with many American guests. We have the best writers, thinkers, and public figures we can find. Tonight, I am very proud to announce to you Karen Slaughter. She is queen of suspense. She's a bestseller author, and I'm very happy that the Bezig Bij made an excellent translation made by Ineke Lenting, um, a translation of her latest, Faithless. And in a moment, Karen will give you an outline and a talk about her work and about her um, sources of inspiration, I hope, and speak about her amazing work. Before she will do, I'm very thrilled to also announce you Charles Dantex as a moderator for tonight. Um, I think as many of you know, Charles Dantex is a thriller writer himself. Born in Australia, I say this because I think his English is very good, and he only lived there five years, he told me this tonight, but he's Dutch uh, also, but also Australian. And in 2002, he won a very prestigious prize in Holland, the Gouden Strop, um, for Schein van Kans. And his latest, De Macht van Meneer Miller, is just out, and I saw it already on our bookseller's table, so I'm very proud of that too. Charles and Tex will introduce Karen Slaughter and will interview our guest of honor here on stage, and you will be invited to take part in the Q&A session, as Charles indicates so. At around 9.30 or so, we'll close off the evening, but before that, I will be back to tell you some more. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, for me, too, it's a great honor to be here and to introduce tonight's leading lady. She has taken this country by storm, and she has taken quite a few other countries by storm. She is a woman who makes writing look natural and who makes success look easy. And it's people like that, well, I tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Slaughter is here to present Faithless the fifth novel in her successful series situated in Grant County in Georgia. It's about Sarah Linton, about her ex-husband and renewed lover, Jeffrey Tolliver, about his detective, Lena Adams, about Sarah's father and mother, about her aunt, Bella, her sister, Tess, and about all the other people that live in Grant County. And we, readers, we feel we know them. And there's a reason for that. It is because Karen Slaughter writes real people. She writes the lives of real people, of families, of relationships, with all their quirks and their idiosyncrasies. In her books, people say things that I could say myself if ever I found myself in one of her situations, which luckily I don't. But she does it well. She does it really well. She takes her time to introduce us to the people of Grant County. And in her new book, Faithless, she takes some 30 pages to tell us of Jeffrey and Lena's first visit to the family of a murdered girl. 30 pages. And you read through them like it's not even half that long. She introduces in these pages a large, weirdo, cult religious family of brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and all manner of people, all tied together in a complex power structure and a complex power game. And at the same time, she introduces a host of suspects. She combines down-home everyday life, you know, the, the, the worries you have about relationships, about groceries, about mother and daughter competition. She combines that with gruesome and sometimes mind-boggling violence. She brings together the warmth of the home and the cold chill of hatred. She mixes recognizable details in relationships with the unknown details of human savagery. Listen, she goes from this. Sarah Linton stood at the front door of her parents' house, holding so many plastic grocery bags in her hands that she couldn't feel her fingers. Using her elbow, she tried to open the door, but ended up smacking her shoulder into the glass pane. She edged back, pressed her foot against the handle, but the door still would not budge. 
Finally, she gave up and knocked with her forehead. Now that is just lots of homey detail, making it clear from the very start that even that life, even simple life, sometimes gets a little complicated. We are all familiar with situations like that. We have too much to do, we are on our own, and we have no help from the inert world. There is no reason why that door should not cooperate, it just doesn't. From being a perfectly useful object, it has become an obstacle. Of course, later we found out that our father locked it, but still, it's wonderful. And I'll tell you why. For the sake of argument, let's pretend that we don't know from Sarah Linton. We walk into a bookstore and we pick up Faithless, and it's the first time we have ever heard of Karen Slaughter. Okay? So let's pretend. In no more than five lines, we know that this Sarah Linton, whoever she is, is going to have a hard time. For whatever reason, things are not going to go her way. And before we are ten lines into the book, we want to read on to find out what is with this woman. Now that is classic suspense writing. There's no two ways about it. And she does it in the details, from that neat little description of personal confrontation with the limits of what one can achieve, she takes us to this, listen. The gun glanced off her cheek, hitting the collarbone, slipping in Paul's hand. A single bullet fired straight up into Terry's face. The woman staggered, somehow keeping herself upright as she held on to Paul and her boy. There was a gaping hole in her jaw, fragmented bone hanging down, blood poured out of the open wound, splattering onto the tiled floor. They say the devil is in the detail, and Karen Slaughter gives that expression an entirely new and very literal meaning, because she has an eye for detail, and she packs it full of devil. The fragmented bone hanging down, that is by no means the end of it. There is nothing homey about this part of the story. There is nothing there for us to recognize. But because she has drawn us in, step by step, into this world that could just as well have been our own, the violence feels very real. And why does she do it? Well, she once said, what is the point of literary fiction if you're not telling a story? If you are not asking a question at the beginning that is answered at the end, then what purpose are you serving? Crime fiction is asking and attempting to answer a lot of the difficult questions in society at the moment. Violence is such a part of our culture, and people want to know why. She seems to imply that writers have an obligation to serve a purpose. That may be pushing it a little. I mean, even writers are only human. Nevertheless, the point is valid. Not just where does all this violence come from, but how do people deal with it? Well, the simple answer is, it takes time, lots of it. That is what the author impresses on her readers time and again. Wounds do not heal overnight. The scars are there and the pain stays inside. Sometimes her characters don't get over it, not in a thousand pages. They fight it, they suffer it, they push it away, they try to ignore it, but in the end, they carry it with them through their lives. That is very different from the standard thriller approach, which still seems to be you whack a couple of people, maybe you get hit yourself a couple of times, but hey, that's part of the job, and you don't complain about it. Next day you may show a scratch or two, but by the end of the chapter, all physical evidence is gone. Everyone is as good as new. I don't know how many of you remember Roman Polanski's Chinatown. In that movie, Jack Nicholson stars as Jake Gittes a private investigator who stumbles upon some kind of murder scheme involving the control over the water in a particular area. Whatever, that doesn't matter. That is not what the film is remembered for. It is remembered for the fact that Nicholson, its scar, acts a large part of the movie with a huge band-aid stuck across his nose because early on a bad guy shoved the switchblade up there and cut him. And miraculously, the resulting wound did not disappear. He carried his wound and scar until the end. Now at that time, I think it was 1974, that was a novelty. Really, people talked about it. And that was just the physical part of it, because nobody would accept Jack Nicholson having any kind of emotional or psychological trauma from a knife wound, not then and not now. That is fake, and we all know it. But we accept it because it's part of the formula. We are used to it. Until now, because Karen Slaughter turns the formula inside out. Sure enough, her characters are tough. 
No need to worry there. That part of the formula is still intact. Lena is sometimes so tough, she makes Sam Spade look like a sissy. And between them, Jeffrey and Lena have perfected the good cop, bad cop routine. Nobody gets past them. So that's not it. The difference is that nobody walks away, whistling into the sunset. That's over. Lena's toughness is born out of her desire to survive, not out of an impersonal drive to judge others and put them in their place. And Sarah Linton's independence is also very personal. It's not just a cliche for the lone investigator. She doesn't even want to be alone. But her independence is a value she defends even in her relationships. That is what we feel. Not the fantasy of the genre, but the reality of the people involved. We believe them to be real, just as real as she is. The creator of Sarah Linton, the present queen of suspense, ladies and gentlemen, the self-employed supreme ruler of Grand County, Karen Slaughter. Goodness, how wonderful. Uh, I suppose it would be arrogant to compliment you on your speech since it was all about me, so I was inclined to like it from the beginning. Thank you all so much for coming. It's wonderful to be here. I've gotten a, a great dinner with, uh, I hope, new friends and uh, learned a lot about the John Adams Society. I think it's very telling that uh, Holland was one of the first countries to recognize America as a real country, and uh, the Busy V was one of the first non-English speaking publishers I had who recognized me and said, this is someone we want to publish and want to do something with, and of course, uh, Robert, my publisher, and everyone there has done such a wonderful job, and so I must first thank them for making it possible for me to be here and have this wonderful opportunity. So what I'll do is I'll just talk a little bit about myself, um, maybe not in as uh, grandiose terms, but uh, I will tell you a little bit about my life and how it uh, brought me to a life of crime. A very flip answer to that question when people say, why do you write about crime fiction, would be to say I was the youngest of three girls in my family, and anyone who's the baby in the family knows that that could uh, get you to violence very quickly, if not to defend yourself, then to tell on all your family, uh, tell on your sisters for uh, perceived slights. Uh, my first books, of course, were murder fantasies where they both died and I was the favorite child. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, in my later life, some of my books are that way too. I always think Sarah thinks of herself as the favorite child in some ways. Uh, unlike a, a lot of children who do get a lot of attention, though, I think that she resents it in a lot of ways. What I wanted to do when I first started writing was tell stories. And anyone who's been to the American South, and I know that a lot of Dutch people have gone to the South, it's wonderful to hear someone say when you ask them, well, have you been in, to America, to say uh, something other than, yes, I've been to New York, because that's really not America. Uh, and it's nice when people like Charles have been to Buckhead in Atlanta, and they know a little bit about the area. Um, so. I want to write about what I know as my hometown. Um, the South is made of very small communities and sometimes they bunch together and they form big cities like Atlanta. It really is a bunch of suburbs put together. When I was very little, we lived in a place called Jonesboro and that's about 45 minutes from the downtown epicenter. And I remember very distinctly my father saying that the whole town went to hell when we got a shopping mall. And his response to that was to move away. And I think that he takes some pride in knowing he was correct because now Jonesboro, where I lived, is considered a suburb of Atlanta. And everything has just been sucked into this big black hole that is the city. We are one of the most violent cities in America, something that being an American, I have to say, <laughs> we're very proud of. Um, <laughs> And uh, s s stunningly enough, statistically, every day, four to five women are raped in Atlanta. And this gave me pause when I heard this statistic because, of course, I write about violent crimes. Sometimes the crimes are against women. Sometimes they're against men. I'm an equal opportunity offender. But uh, when I heard this, I thought, my God, who do I know who's been raped? And I was surprised to realize that I've known five women in my lifetime who have been raped. And it made me start thinking about when I first started working on Blindsided, which is my first book, and I wanted to talk about towns and situations. They always say, write what you know, but I think you also should write what you want to know. And I am interested in violence, but I'm also very interested in what violence leaves behind. To me, that's what the, the interesting thing is. 
So this takes me back to before I was gainfully employed as a writer, which is a, a true gift, and again, I'll thank my publishers for that. Uh, and I was trying to get published, and I was looking for the right story to tell. I owned a sign company. I didn't believe in being a starving artist at that point, so I, I did have a business. And I had a client that I called on in Buckhead every Monday. And I would go in, and I would get my sign order from her. And then I would go back the next Monday and give her the order and get a new one. So it was a very reliable client for me, a very important client for my business. So one Monday I went in and I said hello to her and she looked very shaken and I asked what's wrong and she said, well, last week after you left, a woman in this office building, which is a 12-story office building, I think about 1,500 people work there, a woman was raped in the bathroom and we were both just shocked. I mean, the bathroom, everyone, every woman in the, the room knows what a sacred place the women's bathroom is. It's where you go to hide. It's, you know, when you have a bad date, it's where you go to sit in a stall and say, oh my God, you know, what am I doing here? All these sorts of private moments you have in a, a public bathroom. And uh, so that was very terrifying for me. And uh, I talked to her a little bit. I said, did you know this woman? She said, no, but I saw her in the elevator every day. Sometimes I would see her in the cafeteria. So I felt like I know her. Then, you know, of course, after I got my order, I left. I went back a couple of weeks later, and she said another woman was raped in a different bathroom last week. Over the course of about eight months, six women were raped in bathrooms in this office building. And being a visitor, a, a fairly regular visitor, I was able to see how much that changed things. Women who could ill afford to give up their jobs left their jobs in this building because they were too terrified to work there. Uh, the, they were, of course, taking measures to, tr to try to protect people. They would say, uh, you know, you should go to the bathroom in pairs, which is almost impossible, especially when you're working. Uh, or they tried to put locks on the doors, but still, this attacker was getting in. Everyone was suspicious of everyone else. No one was talking to anyone. It, women were not talking to other women for fear of, well, what, what if something happens to her? How will I deal with that? What if something happens to me? Uh, the women who were brutalized, of course, did not return to this building. It was just such a horrible place, and, and the violence they endured was a, a very brutal violence. Um, so understandably, they didn't want to return to that place. When they finally caught the person, and this doesn't, of course, ruin the, the book for you, I hope, uh, it was the janitor, and he was hiding in the bathrooms, in the men's bathrooms next door, and jumping over the ceiling and, and attacking these women in the bathrooms. And uh, he was a guy who'd worked there for 15 years. And everyone knew him, and they all gave him Christmas presents, and uh, you know, they invited him to the company parties, and he was just this fixture there. And I thought, my God, I saw this guy, you know, mopping the hall, or you know, he's the one. I I once walked in in on him in the bathroom. He was cleaning a bathroom, and the thought of being so close to that was just terrifying to me. And I wanted to talk about that in a book. I thought this would be a good way to explore violence and and what a change occurs when violence happens in a very small town because anyone who's worked in an office building knows that's very much like a small town. You have the same cast of characters. You've got busybodies and gossips and loose women and all sorts of things. And it's really, I don't think if it's Finland or Holland or anywhere else, small towns are very much alike in the makeup of their characters. Everyone thinks they know each other. And what they find out with something bad happens is that they really don't. So I sat down and started to write my book, and Sarah Linton came to me, and she's the pediatrician and the coroner in town, and it's very common in small towns in the South for the coroner to be an elected official. So uh, Sarah was elected to this post. She actually had to run for office. In most small towns, it's usually the person who's running the local funeral home. Basically, uh, I think the, the criteria is if you don't mind touching a dead body, you can be the coroner. Uh, so this is something that Sarah did in order to challenge herself because she's very interested in being good at things. Uh, like a lot of women, she's a, a very much an overachiever. She returned from Atlanta to work in this rural community and service this rural community. She could make a lot more money if she stayed in Atlanta. For her own reason, she returned to this town, and, and she's giving the, the place where she grew up the benefit of, of her knowledge, which I think is a wonderful thing. 
Uh, she has her ex-husband Jeffrey Tolliver, and Jeffrey is, he's sort of a response to a lot of things I was seeing in crime fiction that I didn't like. Uh, I think women in crime fiction, when they sit down to write their male characters, they think of this fantasy man who's going to pick up after himself and take the trash out and vacuum every day. Uh, and Sarah certainly wouldn't be interested in a man she could push around, and Jeffrey is not the kind of man who uh, unfortunately picks up after himself. So he, he's a little uh, selfish in a lot of ways. Sometimes he'll come in from work and he'll have had a bad day and he'll say to Sarah, I've had a bad day and she's had an equally bad day and, and she'll make some sort of personal sacrifice for him or she'll she'll try to soothe him and nurture him and, and I think that's a very telling relationship because I fortunately know a lot of very strong women and they seldom pick someone who is going to not challenge them every day and make life interesting. So they have a very interesting relationship and it has evolved over the books. When you meet them in Blindsided, of course, the first thing Sarah says when she picks up the phone and it's her ex-husband, the chief of police, is somebody had better be dead. Uh, she doesn't want to hear from him. Uh, in a lot of ways, she, she uh, thinks that she hates him. So we see the evolution of the relationship over the books. And that was another important element for me because I wanted to show not just an evolution of character, but a, an el evolution of relationships. And with the violence that has come to Grant County, I think you've seen a lot of people change, not just the main characters, but the char characters who are in the periphery. Uh, one of the big, big changing characters, for lack of a better term, would be Lena Adams, and she's the only female detective in an all-male police force. Uh, she would have a big chip on her shoulder even without that. And she has experienced something very bad in the first book. And so what you see in subsequent books is her sometimes, to me, heartbreaking recovery from this. Uh, like I said in the beginning, I, I know uh, quite, a, quite a big number of women who have been raped or experienced some kind of sexual assault. And Lena's choice as far as her recovery has been very similar to hers, uh, to, to theirs. Uh, if you read The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold, which I think is a lovely book, I think it's also crime fiction, uh, what would that book be without the crime? You see that Alice Siebold is a wonderful writer, but her first book was actually a memoir of the rape she experienced in college, and it's called Lucky. And here's Alice Siebold, who came from a very nice middle-class family. She went to one of our better schools on the East Coast. She had a bright future. She went to this college. She was brutally raped. And several years later, she was a drug addict and homeless. So this, to me, is, is something that we often see women do to themselves, is they find a way to punish themselves when something bad happens to them. And they make bad choices. A woman who has been raped is, I think, 85% more likely to be sexually abused at some other point in her life. Women tend to abuse drugs, they'll drink too much, they'll put themselves into situations that aren't necessarily good ones, and they just make really bad choices for themselves. So Lena is a representation of that. I wanted to, to use fiction as a sort of sounding board for what I was seeing in my life. I think that crime fiction is a great way to talk about social issues. So you'll see a lot of things in my books, like you know, sub, the subject of abortion, domestic violence, child abuse. These sorts of topics are very important to me to, to have a conversation about, because I think that it's become in a lot of ways taboo to talk about violence against women. It's as if we have the feeling that if we don't talk about it, it won't keep happening. Uh, and of course, that's the exact opposite of what's occurring. In the 80s, one in every five rape cases was successfully prosecuted in the courts. The bad guy was caught, he was put in jail. And now it's every one in 20. So what's changed? So of course, I'm not actually just writing all these uh, dissertations on violence and uh, you know women who are having bad times in their lives. I'm also there to entertain. So what I wanted to do with my books is show relationships, of course, and also show the town. To me, it, being a Southerner, it's very important to have the town almost as a fourth narrator. And I created an amalgamation of the town I grew up in and where we visited my grandmother and where we visited when we went to Florida and uh, had our vacation on the uh, Redneck Riviera in Florida, which is what the Panama City area is called. We have our, our own Riviera. Um, 
uh, hopefully it's still there. No, no hurricanes lately, I hope. Um, but, you know, it's interesting talking about Florida because I think that's where I got my passion about telling stories. We have a very strong oral history in the South. Atlanta didn't even have a school system until the early 1900s. So children learned at their parents' knee, and they were very agrarian, and they all worked on the farm. And then at night, they would come in from picking cotton or whatever, which is what my father did when he was a child, along with his eight brothers and sisters. And they would sit around the fire, and they would listen to stories. And so fast forward to my childhood. Thankfully, I didn't have to pick cotton. But uh, when we would drive to Florida, I remember being in the, the middle of the back seat with a sister on either side, and of course we would argue whose leg is touching mine, you know, and it, this was pre-air conditioning in cars, and we had vinyl seats, so of course whenever we got up, half our skin was left on the seat. So uh, it was a very uncomfortable ride, to say the least. And what my father did to take us out of this was he would tell us stories, and sometimes he would tell us about people in our family, uh, and it, as everyone knows, it's always nice to be able to laugh at family. And sometimes, of course, he would make things up. He loved to scare us. And I think that's a peculiarly Southern thing to scare the crap out of children because uh, I was at a, uh, a conference in Canada once, and Clyde Edgerton, who's a beautiful writer, Southern writer, was there. And he said to everyone in the audience, how many of you were taken to prison when you were a child on a school field trip and shown the electric chair? where they kill people on death row. And so I raised my hand and Clyde raised his hand and no one else did. Uh, so I think this is something that only happens in the South where they believe in just scaring us to death. And, and it's worked because I'm terrified of, for no reason whatsoever, being put in prison. And uh, th this is something that has guided my life and perhaps made me interested in crime, certainly in punishment and how to avoid it. But my father would tell us stories all the time, uh, and uh, so this gave me an appreciation for stories and also for embellishing stories. There was one he told us once, like many children, around Christmas or Thanksgiving, we had to visit the cemetery where we had many relatives buried, and my grandmother, uh, much to my heartbreak as a child, died when I was very young, and we would go visit her gravesite every holiday. and. Uh, I remember the first time, or my first memory of going to this cemetery, there was a grave and it had a telephone cord coming out of it and going up to a telephone pole. And I asked my father about this and he said that's where preacher John Wilkins is buried and he believes that uh, you know, the resurrection is coming and he'll be resurrected and uh, he wants to be able to call someone to get him out of uh, the grave. And as an adult, this has given me pause, mostly at my own stupidity as a child to believe this story, um, because of course, I think it's in the realm of Harry Potter being the most uh, powerful wizard in the world, but he can't correct his own vision, so he has to wear these very thick glasses. You know, Of course, if you can be resurrected from the dead, I think you should be able to get out of a grave. But my sisters and I were walking along this row of graves, and the one where the preacher was buried, and of course being very mean to each other and being uh, nasty girls in our own right, we always had to dare each other to walk past this particular grave site. And my father was behind us and he rang a bell. And uh, I, I've had several years of therapy and I don't remember how we got back in the car. I do remember feeling suffocated because my sisters were on top of me screaming. Uh, and so when I came to my fifth book, Faithless, I thought, well, what can I write about that will scare the bejesus out of people? And, oh, okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I heard Ruth Rendell speaking once, and someone said, what scares you the most? And she said, I won't tell you, because if I said it was dogs, my next signing, 80 people would show up with dogs. And I was very hesitant to put that in a book and tell people that was what I was most afraid of because I thought, when well, my next signing, 80 people will show up with shovels. Uh, so I took a big risk there. But I, I thought that uh, it was interesting to think about resurrection and rebirth, especially in the South. I think the, the two most uh, interesting topics for us as Southerners and the things we're most passionate about would be religion and sex. Uh, so, of course, those are two things that are very closely, closely intertwined. And then we have uh, their, their favorite cousin, which would be violence. 
growing up on Flannery O'Connor and these scary stories from my father, I have a, a strong background in those sorts of things. And I did want to write about religion in the South because it's not just the South, it's all over the world. Uh, you have these sects of people, and I'm not saying they're good or bad. I tried to be very balanced and faithless, this fifth novel, and not pick a side, because I think that's what makes it more interesting, is if the reader is able to draw their own conclusions. So I have the book opening with this young woman being found buried alive by Jeffrey and Sarah, and uh, they suspect that she has been frightened to death or suffocated by being enclosed in this coffin. And it leads them to this small community in a different town. Unfortunately, I've run out of uh, people to kill in Grant County, so I had to go next door. Um, those of you who have been reading all along will suddenly notice there's a new town. Uh, so that would be Katuga County. Someone has asked me how to pronounce that. I don't think there's a good Dutch translation. Uh, or maybe that is a Dutch word. Uh, so I have Jeffrey and Sarah go to this, this town, and they meet these people. And they're doing something at, in this, this, this sect that I actually have an appreciation for. In a lot of ways, they're practicing what they preach. They're doing what my grandmother did. She was a very religious person. And uh, though I am not a religious person myself, I do remember when I was growing up, she always thought of religion as a private thing and something that enhanced her world and made her life better. And she was never one to look at people and say, you should be living differently. She would say, I should be living differently. And I recall when I was a little girl and my parents would leave me at my grandmother's, some days there would be men walking in from the cotton mill at night, and she knew that they hadn't been fed dinner and that they didn't have food at home. And even though she was very strapped with her nine children and all her many grandchildren, uh, she would invite them in and feed them. And I think that that sort of charity is the thing that we should all embrace. Uh, so there is a good side to this sect I'm writing about because they believe in that too. They, they believe in reaching out to people. Uh, unfortunately, one of them has died in a very brutal way, and it opens up their community to outside investigation. And with any crime, it changes a community, and it very much changes the sect in a lot of ways. So hopefully you'll enjoy reading about those changes, and you'll feel like you've had a little bit of the South, so the next time you visit America, you'll skip New York and come straight to Atlanta. But thank you all for coming. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, they, what, what we will do now is we'll have a short interview, okay. and then um, there will be an opportunity for people in the audience to ask questions. Um, but um, I would like to say that if there is anybody who wants to put a question to Karen Slaughter before we have finished the interview, please don't feel afraid to do so. Um, uh, we have read in other interviews with you, um, that this fifth uh, novel about uh, Grant County is uh, the last for now, and that your next book will be not will not be about Grant County, but will be about something else. Would you care to tell us a little? Well, it's uh, called Triptych, and it's a standalone book. Yeah. It is outside of the series. It takes place in Atlanta, it's very urban and gritty, and I open the book with a, a dead prostitute, which is something I never get to do in Grant County, because certainly they don't have many prostitutes there, so if I killed them, there <laughs> wouldn't be many left. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a story that I had been working on in my head for a long time, but it really wouldn't fit with Sarah and Jeffrey and Lena. It wouldn't be a good story for them to tell. Uh, and it was a good opportunity to talk about new characters. I wanted to be very careful not to just have my same characters from Grant County and move them to Atlanta and give them new names and relationships. Uh, there are four narrators, and it's told in three parts, as the title would imply. Uh, and it's, it's been a lot of fun to do. But uh, my next book, Skin Privilege, is back in the series. So it, th th number five <laughs> was not the end. No, and no, no, I understood. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, do you envisage uh, moving outside of Grant County for longer periods of time? 
I really don't know. I, I suppose it's the same with you when people ask you if you'll one day write something, you know, outside of your comfort level or outside of what you've you've normally been doing. And as a writer, I think that mostly what you're interested in is telling good stories. So as long as I feel like I have good stories to tell, mm. I'll just keep doing it. Yes, but I mean, it, what you said just now, you said um, uh, you write about the things that you know and uh, you also try to write about the things that you want to know. Um, uh, are you ever tempted to sort of move way out of um, your, local, your own locality, Georgia, mm. and to some other part of the world, and then um, write the story from your point of view, uh, or from the point of view of a, someone from the southern United States, in that different surroundings? Well, I don't, I, that, it that doesn't sound like an interesting thing to do, and sometimes I was in Finland last week, for for example, and of course when I come to Holland, which I'm not just saying this, it was definitely one of my favorite countries in the world, um, I always think, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to move here for three or four months and research and uh, come up with a story to tell, but for me, it's so important. I have such a, an identity with the region I grew up in, and I want to show this region as I see it, rather than as Hollywood or you know, playwrights. Or we, you know, we have this this anti-Southern uh, sort of religion that's going on in America, where the South is considered a second-class area. Uh, it wasn't until the hurricane that you found all these stars, these Hollywood stars, coming out and saying, "Well, yes, I was. I'm from the South." Yeah. Uh, it became suddenly popular to be Southern for a while. Um, but for me, uh, yeah, that's, well, we're America, we have a very short attention span. For me, I <laughs> wanted to write about my, my place of birth and, yeah. and show it in, in a positive light, and, and I'm very proud of that. And we have such a long history of Southern writers. I mean, when you think of some of the just great American writers who have come from the South, that's quite a history to live up to. So maybe I'll, uh, when I finish telling those stories, I'll move on, but that could be some time. Okay. Um, you just said, uh, said something about doing research. Um, how important is research to your stories? I think it's very important to know all the rules out there so that you can break them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a, uh, a doctor friend, and I'll call him up, his name's David, and I'll say, you know, could Sarah do this? And he'll say, well, yes, but everyone would be dead. Or, you know, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll ask a friend of mine who's a police officer about certain procedural things. But uh, my second book, for instance, uh, which is called Kiss Cut yeah. in English, uh, Jeffrey is involved in a police officer shooting a civilian and anyone who's watched a cop show knows that the first thing they do is tell you take the week off and we'll investigate this. Well it would be very boring to have Jeffrey sitting at home in his underwear watching TV all week so yeah. I had to bend that rule a little bit but most of my research is uh, a tangent from what I really need to be doing. It's an excuse to, to look at other things and think, you know, wow, what an interesting statistic, but I'll never be able to put that in my book or I'll never be able to write about it. Um, I think it, in a lot of ways it, it's uh, an excuse to, to be away from writing. Uh, so it's good to go back and, and try to just get the flavor of what I'm trying to capture in there. But as we discussed earlier, the fun part is making it all up. Yeah. That's what I think making it up is nice, but I mean, you are not the kind of writer that sort of outlines a book all the way from the beginning no. to the end and has the facts plotted in by chapter no. and then sits down to write it. No, the, see, it's the fun part figuring out. I know how it's going to start and how it's going to end and who the bad person is because I think it's important to know that. Uh, but the in-between part, the figuring out why this person did it, uh, why the bad person committed this crime, is the most interesting thing to me because I don't believe people do things just because they're evil. There, there's, to me, not such a thing as evil. There's, uh, you know, mental illness. There's a way that your brain is wired. There are environmental triggers that lead you to, to, to believe that you can break a social contract. And that's what's interesting to me is why is this person doing it and how is this going to change this little community I've created? Mm -hmm. Do you plot your characters, or do they just grow with the flow? I think they go with the flow. Uh, I've 
I uh, heard once that Jeffrey Deaver outlines every part of his book and that his outlines are longer than his books. Mm. And that would make me insane. Maybe I'm, I'm too much of a rebel. I hate being told what to do even if I'm the one telling myself. <laughs> so uh, I always want, if, if I have found when I've tried, because you know, well other authors do it, why can't I? Mm -hmm. I've sat down and tried to do an outline. I'll go the complete opposite way. So maybe an outline is useful in some regards, but I, I really don't like doing them. If you look at the, if you look back the characters that you have created, I'm sure you do. Um, uh, there's an interesting thing that um, goes on between the women and the men. Um, very often the women are, have much more volatile characters than the men do. Um, uh, very often they, they get angry really quickly and they, um, uh, they want to respond almost aggressively to certain situations, whereas the men are really pretty cool about things. Um, and they, they do not have that kind of volatile character. And every once in a while I get this feeling, well, you know, she's, the women are the bad guys, you know, because they, um, they have such volatile characters. Is that something that grew into it, or is, do you have a different view on that? Well, I have a slightly different view. I think that it depends on the situation whether Sarah is going to be the strong one or Jeffrey is going to be the strong one. Or with Lena, though, uh, I will t co totally give you that. She's very angry, hmm. and she expresses anger in a very violent way. But it, it's interesting to me because uh, I, I do a lot of research, reading newspapers and magazines and that sort of thing. And young girls in America are becoming much more violent. Now, anyone who's ever been a teenage girl and gone to high school knows that a teenage girl can be just pretty much the most horrific person alive um, toward another teenage girl. I mean, we, we have a tendency to cut to the bone at that age. I think we don't learn the subterfuge until we're an adult. So uh, it, it's not something that hasn't been around for a while. But what we're seeing is these girls are picking up knives and guns and they're joining gangs and, and it's, it's just amazing. It's certainly not skyrocketing by any means, but it went from being around a 10% rate of arrest for young girls to 30% in as little as 10 years because these girls are becoming more violent. And of course they're blaming video games, they're blaming the media, they're blaming books, they're blaming all these things. Uh, but what I think we should focus on is why are they angry? And so with my books, when you say to me, it seems the women are angry about some things or they have a shorter fuse, I, I think, well, what in the story is making them angry? What's giving them a shorter fuse? Why, why would someone like Sarah, for instance, in Kiss Cut, she's so livid that she's missed that child abuse has been happening. She's a pediatrician and just this horrible thing has been happening in her town. And her anger is mostly focused toward herself. Uh, and you have Lena acting out in a lot of ways. But as I was saying earlier, she's doing what a lot of women who uh, have been abused do, which is turn anger on themselves. Mm. And so I would, I would say, look at the direction of that anger. Where is it directed? Jeffries is directed towards the bad guy. Lena is saying, why didn't I see that? Sarah is saying, why didn't I do better? And Jeffrey is saying, let me put this guy in jail. Do you, um, are you a very disciplined writer? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, very. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that like your wife, who was a journalist before she became a writer, that, that writers like that who have evolved into fiction writers have such a great advantage over someone like me because I didn't have a journalism background. I didn't have to write for a deadline. So there wasn't an editor telling me, have this ready at three o'clock. Uh, publishers are very nice to you. They'll, they'll say, oh, that's okay. Just give it to me next week. And they're always very understanding about missing deadlines, which uh, probably isn't the wisest thing to do because authors are famous for uh, delivering books uh, two seconds before they're supposed to be on the presses. Um, so it's very hard for me, and unfortunately I work very well under pressure. So at that last minute when it has to be done, that's usually when I do it. That sounds pretty much like a journalist to me. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a year, they have a week maybe. That's right, yeah. a day. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, um, 
as you said and I said, um, there's a lot of very specific violence in your books. And um, uh, you explained that you, that one of the reasons that you um, uh, write that kind of violence is because you are interested in what it does to people and how they go on after the violence. But you are, in the violence that you write, a lot more specific than many others. And why is that? I think it's important to show violence for what it is. I do love Mary Higgins Clark, Janet Ivanovich, you know, women who are writing sort of a soft, softer, certainly a softer version than what I'm writing. Um, I, I do like that, but I think that there is a different audience for that. I think that for what I'm doing, I really want to show how horrific these crimes are, how people deal with the crimes, and you don't really appreciate, for instance, what Lena has been through unless you know, as a witness, the acts that were perpetrated. Um, I think as a woman I'm more interested in the violent aspects of a crime, whether it's some sort of titillation because it's like slowing down to look at an accident and thinking, thank God that's not me, or if it's just saying, well, you know, this is what it is, this is what happens. Uh, I think that either reason, is a good reason to start talking about violence because for a long time women weren't supposed to be interested in this sort of thing. It wasn't considered very ladylike to, to know about the, the brutal crimes that are occurring. Uh, we were kept in the dark about it and that has helped attackers. It's helped sexual predators. Certainly in America um, now that we are more conscious that there are sexual predators against children I think that parents are being much more vigilant about that. And it's not as if we haven't always had pedophiles in our midst, some of them in the entertainment community. Uh, it's that we're, we have not been aware of it. And it was much easier for these predators to victimize children and victimize women because no one knew about them. Um, so I think talking about it and looking at it for what it really is is a good way to open up a conversation or a broader conversation about what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> well, um, what I was thinking at one point is that, you know, whenever you start to really spell out the violence, because that's what you do, and you do it in such detail, I mean, the, that is very um, characteristic of what you do. You, you pick out the, the details of the violence, and then at one point I thought, God, I would hate to think what happens when she turns her pen to psychological violence and starts to describe that kind of violence with the same detail of how, how people can be tortured mentally. Um, are you ever tempted to do that? Sometimes I am. I think that psychological torture is a, a whole new ball game, as it were, for me. Uh, it is something that I would like to eventually explore. I think that the reason, or hopefully, I, I'm, maybe I'm deluding myself, the reason why the violence has such impact is because the reader cares about the characters. I think if you don't care about a character, then you really don't care what happens care to them. Yourself. So my main goal is for you, I mean, I know that people are very polarized about Lena, which is a good thing, yeah. um, but there has to be someone in the book the reader identifies with and is rooting for and wants to see what's going to happen to this person I care about. Are you going to try? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing I wonder about is um, where do you go from uh, from what you are doing now? Do you, do you have an idea of um, further developing the the kind of themes that you are dealing with? Yeah, I have a real clear plan about where I want the Grant County series to yeah. go. After Skin Privilege, which is, I'll, I'll give you a, a loose uh, synopsis of it. It's about Lena. For, some, for someone who doesn't plot ahead, you seem to be well, working pretty much ahead. Well, <laughs> I, I think about my characters. So with this one, it's about Lena, and basically everything that you've read about her uh, so far has been a lie. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the book after that is called Genesis. 
and All as right. the, the title right. suggested, it, it's a, a, a very new beginning for everyone. So a, mm -hmm. a lot of changes are coming up. You, so you are work, actually working um, three years ahead? Yeah, yeah. Planning I guess three that's years my, ahead. I don't actually outline, but no, once no. I get the title, it starts telling me what the story is. Really? Yeah. Right. Well, that to me sounds like an enormous kind of discipline. Oh, well, no, no. No? <laughs> no. It's my marketing background from my sign company. It's like, what, what am I going to do next? Mm. I see. Well, um, to come back to the, uh, uh, the role that religion plays in your books, you, um, uh, especially the way, and you referred to it as well, the way you introduced that sectarian family in your latest book, um, which I thought was actually one of the strongest parts of the book because um, without noticing what was happening I was completely drawn into this family and um, uh, you know it's very easy to um, have all sorts of preconceived ideas about these kinds of groups and families and um, you did that really well because um, on the one hand, you, uh, you had Lena in there, uh, giving a voice to uh, all those preconceived ideas, and also because of her past and what has happened to her, um, uh, giving a voice to, um, well, a, a kind of repulsion, really, of, of that kind of um, uh, religious sect. And on the other hand, you have Sarah's mother, who and and her sister in the latest in the latest book, who um, uh, want or who, who do not question don't have any questions about the religious part of their life, um, is that in the faithless it's also very much a driver of the story, um, uh, and. The question I have is, do you feel that the religion or the religious part is um, something that uh, also uh, is a cause of the violence that occurs? Or do you think it's just part of life and uh, something that people are involved in? Well, I never see religion as a cause of violence. I always think of it as a justification for violence. You can go back as far as the Crusades um, and see just where religion has been such a useful tool. Um, there are certainly, I believe, positive sides to religion. I think it can enhance people's lives. Uh, I also think it can ruin people's lives. And I don't see a very large difference between one nation saying, we believe in this God, and you are wrong, and another nation saying, no, we believe in this God, and you are wrong. I mean, no matter how this manifests itself, it, there's something inherently um, brutal about saying you should choose a side or you should believe one way or the other. But what I think it boils down to is what most crimes boil down to, which is power. And people want to, to have power, and usually the money that comes with it. You seldom see power without money. Uh, you need only go to the Vatican uh, to understand that. Yeah. Um, so I think that 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 it's a, a great justification. And for me, writing this particular story, I wanted to show the the sect, but I also wanted to show through Kathy and through Tessa yeah. that you know this religion isn't necessarily bad. There's a, a tendency, especially in Atlanta, where I live, a very cosmopolitan city. Uh, we have lots of immigrants. We even have our own little Finnish and Dutch communities and all kinds of people. Greeks, we're all there. Um, and uh, so there's this tendency for uh, us to think, well, people who believe in religion, they must not be very bright. They must need that crutch. Um, and uh, it's okay if you're a Mennonite or an Amish or something cool, but if you're a good old Southern Baptist, That's cool? well, yeah. If you oh, I mean if you're good okay. old Southern Baptist, you know, something we're we're familiar with, then something must be wrong with you, and you've been brainwashed. So when I started writing this story, I really wanted to have 
have through Kathy and Tessa mm -hmm. to show this way, this this kind of third way that religion can be a positive thing, and that was mostly probably something that you will understand as a writer. You want to show both sides. You don't want to preach to your reader and direct them in this one direction. Of course, unless it's a red herring. Um, and, and tell them how to feel about this. You want them to come to that on their own because then they, they feel like they're more a part of the story rather than being led by the nose through it. That's true, but that doesn't, that doesn't go for the way you talk about the violence. It's interesting because uh, I was just at BoucherCon, which is a very large mystery convention in America. About 2,500 fans come out to see their favorite authors. and. I was sitting around in the bar uh, with a bunch of friends of mine, and uh, it, it was me and a couple of other female thriller writers who write in my genre, and uh, Harlan Coben, John Connolly, Mike Connolly, Mark Billingham, and we, we asked these guys, who are very well-known names internationally, what do you do when people ask you about the violence in your books? And they said, what do you mean? And us girls were saying, well, you know, when they say, why are you writing about violence? Mike, Mike Connolly, why do you have this horrible scene in The Poet? You know, or why do you have, the, to John Connolly, why do you have this woman stung to death by venomous spiders? Why? And they said, nobody ever asks us about that. Is that so? Yeah. Hmm. So it is interesting to me that uh, I think it goes back to re whether or not it's ladylike to talk about violence. Of course women are interested in these topics. Uh, we're, we're more likely to be victims of these sorts of crimes. Um, we make up the majority of readers, not just for thrillers, but all novels. Uh, I, in America, 85% of all readers are women. So this is the sort of thing we're interested in. We want to know more about it. As I think I, I can speak for most women here, uh, when we're little girls, we get the, this lecture, don't talk to strangers. Be careful of your surroundings. Know who you, who you are in contact with. Uh, and little boys are just told, you know, come back in at 6 for dinner. Uh, when a woman is walking in a dark parking lot and she hears a noise, she looks around. I think when a man uh, or hears a, a noise, he confronts the noise, you know. So we have different ways of looking at that, things. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in, in Buckhead you weren't so <laughs> No, no, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't confronted, no, no. But we do, we have different ways of looking at violence. And I always think of one of my favorite writers is Mo Hader. I think she's a wonderful writer. And her last book, Tokyo, uh, was uh, considered extremely violent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, someone actually asked her, because she used to be a model, what's a beautiful woman like you ri doing writing about this sort of thing? Mm -hmm. And I thought it showed great restraint that she didn't um, show him exactly what violence she was capable of. But, uh, <laughs> but it, does, it, it, does, it always interests me that, that that's an issue, because to me, I'm telling a good story. Look at Dickens. Beowulf, for instance, um, The Great Gatsby opens with a murder. Alice Siebold, The Lovely Bones, what a, a very brutal graphic rape and murder that has. Um, all these books we have, these enduring books, they're not about the violence, they're about the story. No, that's true. The, the reason I, I asked, um, and this is not um, uh, to contradict you, but I personally, I always try to steer away from uh, writing uh, about violence. Not that there's no violence in the book, but I, um, I try not to write about um, the actual uh, physical acts of violence and what that does to human bodies. Um, so that's where my interest comes from. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different way of uh, going about the story. But that's the wonderful thing about books, is there's so many different ways yeah, of telling different yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that in America you can walk into a store and say, I want a mystery where a cat solves the crime, and he's owned by a woman who knits. And they say, oh, would you like this one or this one or this one? I mean, there are so many books out there, and yeah. even within the genre of thrillers, there are so many subgenres. and you do what you do so wonderfully, and, and people, of course, love your books, and then I have the opportunity to reach people, and you know that, that's what makes it so great, is that you can love a book or hate a book, but at least people are reading. Could you ever envisage 
becoming sort of a company of writers with people doing your research and um, oh yeah I don't see how anyone could do that neither could I it but seems crazy people do that. but don't you find some of your best ideas come when you're looking at one thing and all of a sudden your eyes find this other thing that's completely off the topic and you think oh I've got to use that it's just great yes it does happen yeah yeah but on the other hand I I can't help thinking or wondering what it would be like to have sort of a whole you know company of researchers and people who prepare oh, yeah. the chapters and well, I, would have you know, them bring I could just me sit back and say no or, that's yeah. not good enough no they <laughs> would drink coffee rub my feet you know that sort of yeah. thing but I would be looking yeah 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 no people do that don't they tell oh, they do I read this wonderful um, interview with Danielle Steele yeah and she's got this gorgeous 10 million dollar mansion in on Knob Hill yeah, in right. San Francisco very pricey and they said well Miss Steele tell us about your day and she said well first I get up and my coffee is brought to me. Yes. And then I talk with the staff about what we'll have for lunch, where the dogs will be walked, you know. Then I do my dictation. And I was thinking, holy crap, I want to be a writer. <laughs> have you ever tried dictating? No, no, because I, in my head I have a very deep voice. Uh, and I sound much more intelligent than I actually am. Yeah. So it was very embarrassing to hear it back and think, oh, no, I don't sound like that. No, you so have to it, dictate to someone else, actually. Oh, oh then you no. don't have to re Oh, hear see, it I, I wasn't even thinking about <laughs> having the staff. It yeah. just seemed too yeah. rich. Yeah. Um, no, because I change things as I'm writing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the whole process is very tactile for me to, to have my hands on the keys and see the, the words on the screen. And, and I always look at it. I, I, I'm by no means a musician, but I have this grand idea in my head that I look at it the same way a musician would look at uh, music uh, when he's seeing it on the bars as I would see it, the words on the page and, and just how they look and how the beats of the sentence go. And I guess that may be my, I, I have to admit, my poetry training in college. I loved Renaissance poetry and I was always looking at that sort of thing. <laughs> okay. And your next question? <laughs> yes. And when you, when you, once you start a book, do you just go straight through to the end or is it in bits and pieces? It's much more bits and pieces. I have the great privilege of uh, having publishers who want me to come do things like this, so I travel quite a bit during the year. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually just block out time and we'll do it in, in actually, I would say, fits and starts, where yeah. I s sit down and, and write the story out. But that's maybe uh, it's because I watch too much um, uh, television as a child. <laughs> Because I always think of things in 30-minute uh, segments, you know, like a sitcom. Uh, and I'm always thinking of scenes that way, where they have a very real beginning and an end. Uh, and I think of my books in those sections. So a lot of times when I'm on a plane, I'll be thinking about the different ways I'm going to do just this one particular part. Yeah. And it's easier to focus on that one part rather than the whole. Okay. Um, let's turn to the audience and see if there is someone out there yes there's someone there I think um, I think the idea is that you come up to the microphone is that oh oh dear no. um, <laughs> please well if you're shy then perhaps you could ask the question and we could repeat it or yes. if anyone yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes So the, so the question was, uh, wh what would I define as evil? Well, I, I just know that, uh, for instance, uh, there was a study recently done, uh, I, I say recently, I think it was the last 10 years, by uh, one of the, the greatest neurologists we have, where he looked at men on death row, and he did CAT scans and MRIs and all sorts of physical exams of these men. And what he found was that 
but for 3%, they all had some sort of frontal lobe damage to their brain. And as you know, working with this sort of offender, that's where impulse control is. So to me, that seems like a physical reason for someone being out of control, or not a reason, rather, but an explanation. Uh, there are people who have their brains wired in a certain way. I mean, we know so much about how fetuses are formed in the womb now and how important different chemicals are at different stages and hormones and those sorts of things. And if they don't get them, then they'll turn out to have various um, diseases or uh, some, some people say that uh, psychopathy begins in the womb. Um, so we can trace things like that. We also know that diseases such as schizophrenia are, are caused by viruses. Uh, T. gondii has been linked to schizophrenia. Um, so these to me seem to be physical explanations. I mean, I don't know if you can look at a child, um, and I'm not saying this as a woman and saying, oh, you know, children are special and perfect because uh, my niece was horrible the first three months of her life. I think we all wanted to put her in a closet because she wouldn't stop screaming. But you can't look at a, a child and, and say, this person is evil. And to me, evil, if you say evil, that means it has to be there from the beginning. And there are physical conditions, mental conditions, um, triggers, societal triggers um, that you have in childhood that can bring these out. Uh, so that by the time you get to someone who's in their 20s or 30s or whatever and is irrevocably uh, criminal, then, then you have, I guess, what people would call evil. I think the biggest problem I have is uh, George Bush's uh, insistence that uh, we are dealing with evildoers. Um, and I always think, no, we're not. We're dealing with people uh, who believe X, Y, and Z. You know, let's look at that. Yeah. Well, I, I think that it's an interesting, um, an interesting field. I think that maybe we'll never know, that we can only say to ourselves, well, this is what makes sense to me, or this is what doesn't. Um, that, that's all we can do. And I, I totally respect your opinion, and I certainly respect what you do for a living. But I, I understand that um, your point is that um, as soon as you can put a physical uh, trait on some kind of character or behavior, then you can no longer call it evil. Because yes. evil is a, is a sort of a category outside all others. Yeah, I think it's a good explanation. Hmm? I think it's a good explanation um, for things that maybe, um, certainly not you, but things that people don't understand or things that they're afraid of. Yeah. And when someone does something so horrible, I mean, why, how can they be human like I am? They must be evil. Mm. Because that is what most people will think mm -hmm. to the, the kind of things that happen in your book, especially in a small com community. Mm -hmm. The entire community will be, uh, will be thinking, well, that's evil. You know, that will maybe the first thing they think. Um, yes, exactly. But it doesn't really enter into your stories. No, it's not something I choose to write about, but there are certainly authors who are, are, yeah. are very into that. Minette Walters, for example, it has a brilliant perspective on that, and I love her work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Well, you could say their actions are evil, but what programmed them? Yes, but that, that is interesting before it happens. But now they are evil, and they have this long period in which they can make all kinds of horrendous choices. We have the explanation. Now there is absolute evil. I, th I think if I can, um, there's a couple of things that seem to sort of 
um, uh, uh, get at cross um, purposes here. Um, you can ask the, such questions about what is evil and what is whether it exists. These are very valid questions. But on the other hand, you have to understand that um, we are talking about writing fiction. Um, and there are, to my mind, very practical considerations um, to take into account. I would personally say that somebody like Patricia Cornwall writes about evil people. Yes. It is a choice that the writer makes. I find her books less interesting because there is no, um, no attempt or uh, even necessity for further explanation because the perpetrator is evil. So what do you want? You know, that is the end of the story that can be told. Karen Slaughter chooses to... No, no, but... Yes, but what I'm trying to say is that that is not the kind of person that she chooses to write about, you see. That is where the fiction and the reality get to be at cross purposes. Is that right? Yes, yes. But, I mean, just uh, to, to, I guess, answer your question, what do you do with them? I really don't know. I mean, we have such a horrible prison system in America where we have super prisons, where we have very violent people who cannot be outside of a prison without being violent. And within a prison, they're more violent. They kill guards. Uh, and we put them in these cells for 24 hours a day for six days a week, and then 23 hours a day for one day of the week. And we have, in, in, in a lot of instances, made these people mentally ill from this sort of isolation. But what's the, what, what's the alternative to let them in the prison community where they organize gangs and kill more people? I, I don't know what the answer is. I certainly can only say what we're doing now is wrong. Uh, but uh, it, it seems very, uh, very much like a writer to say, well, this is wrong, but I can't offer a solution. Yes? Yes. Yes, I love reading. I mean, that's one of the great things about traveling is I, I get to read so much. Um, I just finished the Manette Walters book that I really enjoyed, The Devil's Feather. Um, I, I mentioned Mo Hader, um, Denise Mina, Peter Robinson. Basically, if you look at my short story collection I did about the charm bracelet, I sat down and I thought, who are my favorite authors? Uh, Mark Billingham, John Connolly, you know, all these people came to mind. And but for one person who was uh, well past a deadline and couldn't uh, contribute, they all said yes. So uh, the, the one I'm proudest of, though, is Emma Donahue. She writes wonderful historical fiction, um, and I love her books. Um, so I, I do read across the board, and Linda LaPlante, I, that, that just shows you that I have very different interests. I read a little fantasy. I like Neil Gaiman, Kelly Armstrong. Basically, anyone who's telling an interesting story about characters, uh, I'm completely there. Um, Catherine Harrison, her last book was a little too much about character for me, but I think she could write about paint drying, and it would be the most fascinating thing in the world. <laughs> yes? Anybody else? Okay. Well, Karen, thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, we had a nice interview. Yes. Yes. And um, uh, I think we give the microphone back to Monique. Well, thank you again, Karen. And I think um, you need an, a hand. I mean, I mean, we can give you a hand because you gave a wonderful, um, a wonderful talk. Um, I love your explicitness, and I think um, the way you write. Um, um, reflects the way you talk tonight. I think it was a very frank and uh, open talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for Charles for introducing Karen and keeping dialogue and thank you all for coming. Um, Karen promised me that she will sign books and I think Charles will do too if you like. Um, the next John Adams event is in 
There are two uh, this month still. We're doing something together with the ITFA, uh, with Lewis Lapham, and there is something which is going on in Leiden. Uh, talk on John Adams again. You can find out more on the information table. Also about another thing we totally uh, organize ourselves, which is in The Hague on December 7th with Amitai Etzioni, something completely uh, different. It's not fiction, it's non-fiction, it's about commute you know, what is it, communitarianism, it's something about, <laughs> I cannot even explain it, but it, no, I can explain it, it's about how society glues, so what are the common values, that's something which our Prime Minister, Mr. Balkan, and I think is very important, he wrote a preface and he will come there to, to accept the first copy, so that's on December 7th, so if you're interested, you have to travel all the way to The Hague. Well, thank you again for coming, I hope you can stay a little longer for a drink or so and talk to Karen some more. Thank you so much.